I answered an advert, and it just had dollars, 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 and who doesn't want those? And I turned up, and I arrived in this massage parlour, and it was winter, and it was Dallas days, you know, and the women wore these fabulous gowns, and I was a dowdy school teacher, being interviewed, and they were giggling. And I didn't have a clue what I was being hired for, but I was hired. Nobody explained to me about sex, let alone commercial sex. They just said it's easy. And literally I was hired on the basis that it was easy. Of course, somebody took me to one side and explained the ins and outs, but that was illegal, almost, because they could have been done for being a party to operating a brothel, and they could have been sent to the slammer for five years. So I think it's important that people can communicate, can talk freely, can talk properly about the real nature of sex work, exactly what it entails. And I have to say, even working for the Prostitutes Collective, even having a formal government contract, which we've had since 1988, our hearts would sometimes speed up a bit when we'd take that phone call and we'd think, is this entrapment? Are we about to be a party to um, something illegal here? You know, somebody would ring up and say, look, I'm thinking about doing it. And, um, or, you know, one of the massage parlour proprietors would ring and say, can you bring around some of those little thingies? And you'd say, for God's sakes, don't say that, because they'll think we're running drugs, you know, out of here. Just name the word condom. But, of course, when something's illegal, you can't talk to all of that. And I know I'm preaching to the choir, so I won't go on. But it's so important that people can advertise and talk freely and that that, that not be made illegal. And I think for dopey people, too, like me, had I known that it was going to be higher into a brothel, maybe I might have been a bit more circumspect. I'm glad I wasn't, though. <laughs> um, we have also made concessions around brothel operators. It was interesting because in, t in the spirit of fair play, everyone was asked what they wanted. And, of course, the massage parlour proprietors were used to being licensed and they were used to having a fair bit of dominance over the sex industry, and they felt they had this legitimacy um, with a licence. So while we as an organisation said, you don't need to have a licensing system, the brothel operators said, look, we'd like something official that recognises us as brothel operators. So they have what's called an operator certificate. It's easy to get. It's not onerous. You fill out a form, you pay $205, and you send it to the district court. It's held in utter confidence. The police don't get to approve who becomes a brothel operator. They don't even get to know who's a brothel operator. Um, they do have powers of inspection on certain conditions and must uplift a warrant. They can't just barge in like they did when I was a sex worker, as of right, supported by the law. So the brothel operators, they have a certificate. Actually, it's about as big as a driver's license in our country, like a personal card. It's not required to be on display. Nobody has a right to say, look, what's your name? Um, unless, um, if they are the police, they must have a warrant and they must have a good reason. And a good reason is to be looking for someone under the age of 18 who would have been hired or facilitated into prostitution illegally. It's, it's against the law to hire someone under the age of 18. For the most part, the brothel operator's certificates are ignored. Everyone knows who keeps a brothel. Everyone chats. It's easy to identify where the brothels are. You don't need a formal register of names to do that. Um, the other thing we have is health and safety guidelines. Now, our good mates across the ditch in Australia developed some superb health and safety guidelines. So if you go online, you might find the second um, 
tier of these, which is the New Zealand Occupational Safety and Health Guidelines. And we have certain things covered off in these guidelines, standard things like how hot or cold room temperatures should be, um, you know, how, how often sheets should be changed, you know, that kind of thing that concerns us. But we also have other things that are specific to sex workers, related to attendance, for instance, around regular sexual health assessment. We don't compel or require sex workers to have regular checkups. That makes no sense. I hope that's not a debate here. Um, the frequency of assessment is a matter of determination by the individual sex worker in consultation with his or her clinician, and this is in the Occupational Safety and Health Guidelines, and must be voluntary, and I think that's really important. I know some countries where they've legalised sex work have this onerous regime of testing, which doesn't uh, make any sense at all. It's good to have regular testing, but it should be at your pace. Recently, and I, I, was, I prepared a PowerPoint, so I can only but describe this picture to you. It's of a very sexy girl. And she's holding a sign, and she's saying, our right to say yes, our right to say no. And it was a sign that was developed in collaboration with a lot of different agencies. And the reason I wanted to show it was it could never have happened in a criminalised environment. And it was a sign that's de developed to target clients, in particular those clients who the sex workers said were a little bit troublesome. So it's got a big tick for condoms and it's got a big tick for um, having a shower and all these other things that the sex workers nominated. Um, a big cross for cameras and um, a big cross for force. But I want to say that you know the government agencies that cooperated were really interesting. So we had the Minis Ministry of Business and Innovation and Employment, which is the Labour Department. Um, we have the police and we have the Hawke's Bay Public Health. It's a, it's a particularly provincial region that collaborated on this project. And we have, of course, the NGOs like us and family planning. And we're all on this as a byline to this poster. But interestingly, the local council said that would only come on if we removed the sexy image. Um, because they didn't want to be seen to be promoting prostitution. So here you had you know, the, the local, you know, the, the main government endorsing and the, the local political level sort of um, being a bit um, careful. Um, of course, they were ridiculed. Um, the other thing that we have in terms of signage, and it's, it's very low level, um, is information for clients. And they must, these signs must be displayed or something similar health promotion signs. So that's in the bill, the Act itself, and it says that um, it's an offence if you don't display signs. So it requires some compliance, but livable. Um, I, if I, yeah, I haven't got the PowerPoint, but there's a subtle thing here I want to explain in terms of the New Zealand legislation. For those of you who are really familiar with it, we have a piece of the law that says that everyone must take all reasonable steps to practice safer sex and, and use a condom for anal, vaginal and oral sex. That shouldn't be necessary. Brothels can come up with that kind of in-house policy themselves. Sex workers stand together on these issues. You don't need a piece of legislation criminalising sex workers if they don't comply. And um, to date so far, I think we've had about five clients who have been prosecuted for not taking all reasonable steps. We haven't had any sex workers, fortunately, 
but it is an Achilles heel in terms of sensible public health legislation. And it's one of those awkward things because once it gets into an area of debate in the parliamentary setting, in our case, in the select committee, which comprised politicians like yours um, from, from different parties, it was very difficult to pull it out and say, look, that doesn't make any sense. Because I think we had to, we had to compromise because I don't think the public would have understood that debate. Um, so we have other protections that are there. Medical officers of health are out there. They're a, a level of inspection that's available. We don't have inspectors going around the brothels checking up, which is something that we're all grateful for. It is pretty much uh, complaint driven. Um, I need to explain this. So it might be that a sex worker comes in or rings us up or a client, um, although we're not funded to work with clients, but we're happy to chat. Um, and they might say something like, look, you know, the place where I went last week, the sheets were dirty and I've got fleas and um, there must be someone who can do something about this. So what I think decriminalisation does, it, it raises expectations because this wouldn't have happened. Nobody would have known where to go um, historically prior to the legislation. And more serious issues, for instance, we've got a, a persistent warrior, he's a client, and he rings us quite frequently, and he's a persistent warrior, and he worries after the fact. And we reassure him that he's okay, and um, you know, if he's, if, he's, if he's needing to go somewhere, he, you know, he can go somewhere. And, um, but I'm, I'm sure we're all familiar with these persistent warriors, but more importantly, we get the whistleblowers. Look, damn it, it's decriminalised, and um, shouldn't someone be fixing this up? And I think that's quite an important dynamic because it, it means that people are looking out. They're thinking, oh, that maybe doesn't look quite right. Um, a couple of weeks ago, we had a client ring one of our branches, and he'd been into a Asian-run brothel, and he was worried. He thought the woman he had seen was unhappy and <laughs> made me curious about him and to, but you know he thought to ring and say look you know if if she didn't ha she, I think she had said something like she was working you know a, a lot of shifts and she was tired and so on and so he worried you know that perhaps she was being made to work and were we familiar with the situation so I think it's really important not to shut your clients down because they are a massive resource for speaking out. And boy, do they ever. Sometimes you wish they'd shut up because they get online and, you know, you know they do those wonderful reviews and so on online. But, you know, seriously, also when they feed into issues such as the anti-trafficking concern, they really play a very significant role. So, it's, I, you know, I hope that people will recognise that clients are a part of society and not some demonised other, you know, grey-coated, um, not, not part of society at all. And I, I think there is a danger, too, where definitely people conflate and quite deliberately, those who are against sex work legislation, supporting sex workers and their rights, conflate a lot of these issues. You know, we're familiar with other debates where this occurs as well, where you know, pedophiles and schools and children and perverts all get mixed up with you know, the paying client. Um, try, you know, try and avoid if possible, but I know that you're up against the wall on that one. In New Zealand, we have, we have allowed for clients to continue doing as they've always done, paying for sexual services, and it's still a blue sky down under, I can tell you. And, 
you know, there's nothing, um, you know, there are so many clients, it just seems a nonsense to, to create criminals of them. Certainly sex workers' lives are made more difficult, and I'm glad that, you know, well, I well remember actually hopping on a very quiet night, squeezing in, um, into this, it was a client's car actually, it was a Jag, and driving down to the wharves and we picked up some J Japanese seamen who were very good clients and <laughs> took them back to our massage parlour to help the business go um, a little faster. But you don't want sex workers to be wedged into positions like that. You, you know, you want them to be in positions where th their vulnerabilities aren't going to be exposed. I imagine if those clients were illegal, it, it would mean that you would go anywhere. You'd go anywhere, to any length, really, if you're a sex worker and if you're living off sex work, to, to, to do what you need to do. And it would be very difficult. I know that the Swedish sex workers certainly um, have to duck and hide, and it makes it very difficult for them to sustain their living.